So um, hello, and happy Friday, everybody. I'm Safi Russell from SDR Consulting Inc. And we're here today on Business Basics Friday. Uh, the goal of this session is to provide some value to small business owners in the space of tax accounting and general business, and then have an open Q&A at the end. And so today's topic, we're going to be covering um, IRS red flags, you know, that you may come across and how to mitigate those. And so we have two guest speakers to present that. I'm going to throw in a topic at the end as well. A little background about myself. I'm, my name is Safia Tu Russell. Uh, I'm an enrolled agent and CPA based in New York, and I have a virtual practice, but um, we do work with clients all over. And we mostly work with small business owners, helping them from business formation all the way through to tax preparation and all that fun stuff in between. So that's a bit about me. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. And we have uh, Angie Tony uh, to cover her IRS top red flag. So Angie, you can go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, take it away. Ah, yes. Thank you for having me. I am a CPA licensed in the state of New York. I do live in Virginia and I also have a virtual practice. I primarily focus on clients who already have tax troubles. So I create strategies for them to get the IRS off their backs and out of their pockets. So, okay, well, we can't predict if we're gonna get audited or not. We do know some things that can minimize that risk of getting audited. So audits can come from several places. You can have a snitch, someone tells on you, there are some more aggressive strategies that are out there that people start. They're new, like conservation easements, things like this that people are not used to. And if people are taking advantage, they call them abusive tax avoidances. So if you're participating in some of those, that may trigger an audit. There's a diff score. Every tax return, when it gets filed, e-filed through the system, the computer system, the IRS gives it a diff score. It's it's called a discriminant function system, so, so whatever that means. But uh, the scoring will look at you compared to other taxpayers in your category. Say, for example, you're married filing joint in your region and you're getting a $15,000 refund and somebody else, in, you know, usually people get around 3,000 in your area, it, you're an anomaly. So you're gonna stick out and make get a, a flag for an audit. Uh, large corporations, large uh, wage earners, I'm talking highly compensated, anywhere upwards of, you know, six figures, a high 200s, 300s. Now you're starting it where they're going to look at you. Corporations get annual audits because they're just huge and there's just a lot of money to be found. There's also mismatch in 1099s, W-2s, all underreporting notices. Those are kind of desktop audits. And any other reasons there's so there's a few out there that may get you that flag. So we're going to try to tell you some things to do on your tax return to minimize that risk, minimize that score and keep you. So as you know, we have a voluntary compliance system. So the IRS expects you to tell the truth. So that's your number one way to not be audited at all. Do the right thing. Just report the income that you've earned. And yes, take your rightful deductions and credits that you're entitled to. That's called avoidance. Avoidance is legal. Evasion is what's illegal. So we want to look out for that, right? So I'm going to tell you a couple of things above the line and below the line. When we talk about above the line, we're talking about AGI, adjusted gross income. So anything you put on your tax return above that number has its own set of flags. And then there's the below the line the deductions and certain things that are going to come across. So above the line, you're going to look at things like if a taxpayer puts the wrong address and it mismatches with the social security date of birth, things like that, that's going to always cause a flag because, and again, this is, it doesn't mean that alone. It's just in combination with the other things you're putting on that tax return. So, so it could be a risk for identity theft and things like that. So that's going to flag your return. If you're snail mailing and not using the e-filing system, that could be one because you're trying to get around something. And, and so it's going to flag your return. Again, if it looks different from the average, we have high income taxpayers that are going to stand out. Uh, income reported on the return uh, that's missing under reporting notices. 
Self-employment income Schedule C filers are the most audited of all taxpayers. And that particularly because they're trying to avoid FICA in many cases, they report their income and then just deduct, 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 deduct. And there's certain ways when you're putting deductions and guess what, if you end a lot of things in zeros, that's going to flag you because the IRS feels like, well, they're not really tracking, they're just guessing or estimating. And if you have too many estimates, that's going to flag you. So that's why self-employment income on a Schedule C. But sometimes people get self-employment income and they put it on line 21, or I think it's still 21, but uh, or on a Schedule 1 where you have other income and then you're not paying the FICA, that's a flag. Uh, deductions such as education expenses, moving expenses, student loan interest deduction, anything like that is going to flag you. If you have credits, you're going to get flagged. All right. So, and, and that's below the line. So, I'll talk about below the line, like a Schedule A deduction, medical expenses, because we know they're subject to limitation. So, if, if you, among like in that same category of other married filing joint taxpayers in your region are, are not able to take medical expenses, and you are, and you're subject to a 7.5% threshold, and in some years, 10% and you're still able to take medical expense, that could be a flag in itself that it's like, really, you really had that, that much medical expense, especially if you have insurance coverage, where, where are these out-of-pocket costs coming from? So that could flag you. Charitable contributions, disproportionately high, it's large in comparison to your tax bracket. So if you're donating 50, 60, 70% of your income, well, how do you live? How do you pay your rent? How do you eat, you know, and so forth, flag. Uh, business expenses, unusual amounts, um, uh, entertainment, certain things are called strict substantiation. So you better have receipts, 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 receipts. I'll tell you, even if you co-mingle, it's not a big a deal as a lack of receipts because lack of receipts showing that um, you can't substantiate the income uh, or the expense rather. If there's earned income credit or child tax credit, so that's a higher flag, especially if you're not related to that dependent, the qualifying child giving you some of these credits and so forth. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, American Opportunity Credit, if you take it more years than you're entitled, you're entitled uh, as an undergrad to take it for four years. I've had clients who have gone above that four years. So those are, that's a lot, I know, but that's to start you. And I'm going to let somebody else jump in so I don't talk up all the time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angie, for sharing those. And it's definitely, of course, a lot to take in. But the, the key here is that if you're working with a professional, you know, they, they're they not just punching numbers on a form, you know, um, they are... Um, putting together your tax return, hopefully from your books and records, according to the law. And of course, maximizing what's allowed, pointing out things that are a red flag, like you mentioned, those um, you know, rounded numbers. So thanks for sharing that. And so um, next up, we're going to have uh, Shantoya Jones to cover a few more IRS red flags. So Shantoya, go ahead and you're good to go now. All right, I am Shantoya Jones of Acnow Financial Services. Um, physically located in Florida, but also own a virtual practice, so I service clients nationwide, as well as I think I have a couple now, a few internationally as well. Um, my clientele is mainly um, small business owners, including also those Schedule C earners that Angie mentioned. So one of the um, mostly, one of the red flags I want to discuss is the um, using the wrong filing status. Head of household, I think, is one that is widely um, misused or misunderstood. Um, I know the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act identified or now allows us to claim certain qualifying relatives as dependents. However, that does not mean that you're, you're now able to file the head of household using the head of household status. So I would say that that is one of the most um, common red flags that I've seen. Also, I have encountered married couples who have previously um, filed separately, each as head of household, but claiming a child or two of their own. 
you can't be head of the same household. You can't have two heads of the same household. So uh, I will say that most married people, and I, I'm intentionally saying most, most legally married people should not be using head of household. And I'm saying that because there are a few little nuances. Um, it's best to work with your tax professional. And as long as you're honest and they're applying the law correctly, they'll be able to help you identify or file using the correct filing status so that you are not causing a red flag once your return is submitted to the IRS. Um, another one that Angie touched on a little bit also was your business income versus expenses. If your business is consistently making about $125,000 a year and every year you're spending $75,000 on advertising. That's a little strange. Um, you know, of course, obviously, in the first years of your business, you're more than likely or quite possibly going to spend a little bit more on advertising as you're attempting to get your name and your brand out there. However, if that you're consistent, that same using that same percentage of your income for advertising, your, in, your income isn't growing, it could be assumed that either you are under reporting your income or you're over-reporting your expenses. And I'm using advertising just because that's what came to my head. But, um, you know, any expenses, um, any expenses. So the best thing to do is always to file or present your tax preparer. And even I would say probably work with an accountant throughout the year, to be honest, as opposed to just seeing a tax preparer at the end of the year. Work with an accountant throughout the year to make sure that you are doing things that can um, reduce your tax burden or increase your income. And then at the same time, you're also preparing yourself, you know, in advance the tax liability that you're going to face. So you're not um, at the end of the year in April or October sometimes, um, you know, scrambling, trying to find this tax money or trying to see what other deductions you can add on to try and lower your tax liability. So it's always best to just go ahead and report your income and expenses as they actually happen, as opposed to overstating or understating and trying to, um, you know, navigate your way around that. Um, another thing along the same lines of business income and expenses, that is really a red flag, especially when you're like just on the cuff of earning the earned income credit. And so you've made enough, but not too much to get it. So it, it can be a little, um, I mean, of course, obviously it can happen. That can actually be the truth. But if it's not the truth and that's, um, you know, just know that that is a red flag, whether it happened or not, it's probably going to be a red flag. And so you want to be able to um, prove that those things happen. And like Angie said, have your receipts on hand in case the IRS does come knocking and, and asking some more questions about that and wanting some more information. Along those same lines, also the home office deduction. Um, one thing I want to point out is that you should always, your, the home office deduction is not, you cannot write off your entire mortgage or your entire rent payment. It is for the portion of your home that you use regularly and exclusively for your business. So if you are consistently having these extremely high home office deduction amounts and your income doesn't look like it's sufficient to support the lifestyle that would have home office expenses that high, that is also going to be a red flag. So um, it can be true, um, especially if you have other sources, you know, non-taxable income, all of that kind of gets reported on your tax return anyway. But um, you just really want to make sure that the home office deduction um, and all of your business income and expenses are, are accurate and that you can back them up. Perfect. Thank you so much, Shantoya. And that home office deduction is a interesting one because it's not that um, by default, it's a red flag. It's just that it's been so misused um, mm -hmm. that it gets a bad rep, but it is, you know, a valid deduction, right? It is actually, right. um, especially now after COVID, a lot of people are working <laughs> from home. The key is, is it a dedicated space? Meaning it's not your living room where everybody, you know, sits down and watches TV and you have like a, you know, dinner tray with your laptop. <laughs> that is not, um, that's not dedicated, but it could be a corner of the living room. That's, mm -hmm. you know, you know, your desk and your computer and no one goes over there. That square footage right around that desk could be a business use. And then exclusive, you know, <clears throat> are you only working there, you know, one month out of the year or is it regularly, you know, I'm sorry, regular, regular use. So exclusive is the part where it's not used by, for anything else. And then regularly, are you using it throughout the year for your business? You know, or are you, is it a hobby and you just kind of 
you know, whenever you want to go online and make a sale, it's it's random. So, um, and then maybe if you travel, I had someone where half the year they were in one state, you know, and another year, the other half of the year they were at their home state. So was it regular, you know, could you take 12 months worth when you were only there six months? No, you should probably take six months there and six months at the other place if you had an office there. So little things like that. These are the, the nuances that us as tax professionals go through or should go through instead of just accepting numbers the way they are. You know, we get clients that send us stuff. We could just put it in as is. You know, we know things are red flags, but it's really, you know, an injustice if we don't tell you, listen, you need to, you know, get bookkeeping. You need to track your mileage. You know, you can't just keep using these random numbers or rounded numbers because you're setting yourself up for a higher chance of audit. Like Angie said, we can't determine audits, um, who will be audited, who won't. But um, we can definitely point out things that are lower your risk, you could say that. All right. And um, so I'm just going to kind of add in one other red flag um, and get this spotlight stuff going on. So the one I want to cover is um, the uh, reasonable compensation for S corporations. And um, if you are not familiar with an S corporation, it is a election that is done for tax purposes. So it doesn't necessarily change your entity type. You either start out as an LLC or you started out as a corporation and then you made an election to be taxed as an S corporation. That means that your um, business net income, so income minus expenses is gonna flow through to your personal return and it's gonna flow through through something called a Schedule K-1. Now, the difference between an S corp and an LLC or a corporation is the way it's taxed. I won't get into that for today. Um, however, there are some benefits in terms of saving self-employment tax. That's one of the reasons why people do the S corp election to avoid double taxation or paying higher self-employment tax. But it does come with some more um, requirements. So in order to have an S corporation, if you are working in the business, you're actively providing services for your company, then you need to have reasonable compensation. This is what's required um, by the IRS. And what is considered a reasonable compensation? Well, that would be easy if it was a black and white answer, right? Um, it's not. It's what is reasonable for your position in your company based on your geographic location, based on the duties you perform, based on your title. If you were to bring someone in to replace you, what salary would you pay them? That is what the IRS is looking for you to pay yourself as a true W-2 employee that has taxes taken out. You have a payroll service and you're filing those payroll returns quarterly. Now, because your income from the S Corp is not subject to self-employment tax when it flows through to you, of course, taxpayers want to minimize how much taxes they pay. And so what they do is underpay themselves as an employee so that they maximize how much money is coming through to them without those FICA taxes. And obviously the IRS knows that. And so what they're looking for is they're looking at in during the year, how much have you paid yourself as an employee? There's a specific line for officer compensation. And that's where you report your wages versus other employees you may have. So how much are you paying yourself versus how much money did you withdraw from the company? So when you have a company, you can of course write yourself a check and with an S corporation, that's considered a distribution. There's not gonna necessarily be any taxes specific to that distribution. You're taxed solely on the net income of the, of the business for the most part. I'm not gonna cover basis today. So um, if you've taken out 150,000 in distributions, just cash out of the account or a check written to yourself or personal expenses, which is a no-no, but happens from the business, but you've only paid yourself a salary of 25,000, the IRS is gonna come in and say, no, your position should be paying yourself 175. So guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna take all those distributions that you took out. We're gonna relabel them as wages. And now you're gonna owe us late payment and penalties and interest on the social security payments that you didn't make, the FICA payments that you didn't make. And this is something that the IRS has been trying to rev up and, and um, get more um, strict with, I guess, over the years, but budget hasn't permitted. However, they are hiring it aggressively right now, and it is something on the top of their list. So I definitely strongly suggest if you are an S corporation in terms of your election for tax purposes, that you as the officer, the owner of the company working in the business, definitely have yourself set up on payroll officially as a W-2 employee and also have yourself being paid a reasonable compensation. So you can take certain surveys of your area, you know, the position that you're in and what you do and get an idea of what people are paid. 
That kind of research is what the IRS would be looking at to determine if your salary is reasonable. There are companies out there who will do a full analysis of your business, of all your roles, and break it all down between the admin work, which is the professional work, and give you a what they call audit proof reasonable comp. And they've been doing this for a long time. So that's also something that you can consider. But the idea is you just want to make sure you have proof for what you're paying yourself and how it's considered reasonable in your area and, and in your industry. So that's definitely a red flag that may have not been um, you know, uh, um, focused on as much in the past, but it is definitely um, coming down the pipe. So if you're an S Corp and you've been avoiding taxes, please stop. Um, there's no specific percentage, you know, there's no specific ratio, although industry may throw some numbers out there, you just wanna make sure it's reasonable. All right, so I wanted to um, go ahead and add that red flag in. And so for now, we're gonna actually open up the session for anyone who may have questions. And um, whether you are here on Clubhouse or on Facebook, hopefully I can see if you have questions there. I'm trying to manage uh, all three here. But if you're on Clubhouse or Facebook and you have a question, feel free to let us know. Um, Angie and uh, Chantoya, if you guys wanna add anything or um, add a few more red flags or any questions, feel free to chat, chime in. Okay, cool. Um, all right, great. So, so far, no questions. So um, one thing I do wanna go over as an add-in is being that we're getting to the end of the year, right? So Angie had mentioned about, uh, one of you, I'm sorry, Chantoy may have mentioned getting to April and trying to find deductions, you know, cause your tax bill is too high. So we're in October of 2021 right now. Now is the time in fourth quarter to understand what your books look like, understand what your potential taxes look like, this is the time to implement those extra tax deductions. This is the time to implement retirement planning to lower your taxes. Um, this is the time to make sure your books are in order. All right. And also, um, you know, understanding what deductions you have access to, whether it be home office and things of that nature. This is the time to do that. If you're an S corporation, one other thing I want to throw out there is if you are running yourself through payroll and you um, have health insurance that's not through an employer somewhere else that uh, health insurance needs to be properly reported on your W-2. So now is also the time to touch base with um, your payroll company and make sure they are aware of the health insurance applicable to you and your family, because there's a certain way that's reported so that you can benefit from the deduction on your personal return. All right. I do want to add something on, on when you were speaking about the S Corp, and this is to tie in Chantoya's uh, information about home office. When you are in an S Corp, you cannot just simply deduct the home office the way you would on your Schedule C. You have to set up something called an accountable plan to take deductions that you spend in your personal side for your business. You have to do a reimbursement from the S Corp to your personal life. So you have to get that part set up to that is a flag in and of itself to just deduct things you spend on your personal side. Great point, great point. And those those um, accountable plans could be used for home office reimbursement. They also could be used for mileage reimbursement um, because if you have a vehicle and that vehicle is not in the company name, it is your personal vehicle. So although you may use it for business, when you have an S Corp structure, you need to reimburse yourself through the standard mileage rate um, method in order to account for those expenses on your vehicle. If it was in the business name, then it could be set up as an asset of the business where actual expenses such as gas and the, you know, uh, financing um, and, you know, uh, repairs and all insurance, all those things could be accounted for. Um, but it's still limited to your business use. So you could have a company vehicle and you're using it like 50% business, 50% personal. You really have to back that out of the company deductions. So um, thanks, Angie, for adding that reasonable. Um, the accountable plan is, is pretty much just a company policy you need to have on file. And you do wanna do the reimbursement officially, even though you are the owner and you are the employee, you still wanna have a trail of what the reimbursement was and what it was for, and definitely keep those in your records at least you know three to four years, more indefinitely now with everything being in the cloud. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks for adding yes. that. And do it before 1231, because once 1231 ends, that's it. You cannot move that money. You cannot take that deduction. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, especially if you're on a um, cash basis, which most yes. people are. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 
And now speaking of cars, um, we talked a little bit about mileage. So let's just talk on that real quick because people, oh, I drove about 50,000 miles and about 20,000 was business. No one drives an even amount of miles per year. So please use a mileage tracker or please take this time now to start creating your mileage log for 2021 because we're now in October. Tax season will be here before you know it and you'll be scrambling. So if you haven't used a tracker so far, pull up Google Maps, go to your calendar, figure out where you went from point A to point B and just create your log. So you're well prepared for your tax preparer. Um, and so I don't think we have any questions, which is you guys were very thorough. <laughs> so thank you again. <laughs> and so what we're gonna do is um, go ahead and close out with uh, sharing our information. And you know this will be, um, transfer to my uh, new podcast at some point. So you'll definitely be able to listen to it again. And if you are listening in through uh, Facebook Live, it will be saved there. So feel free to share. Uh, we'll be here every Friday, 12 p.m. Eastern, schedule permitting. And so definitely if you have some topics you'd like to hear, feel free to let me know about. Um, and we look forward to having you back again. So I'm gonna just close out and I'll have you ladies close out as well. And again, if you joined us late, I am Safia Tu Russell, founder and CEO of SDR Consulting Inc. I'm a CPA and enrolled agent. And um, the best way to reach um, my firm is uh, www.sdrconsultinginc.com or 516-2556603 as well on social media at SDR Consulting. And we mostly work with small business owners, helping them from business formation all the way to tax preparation. So uh, Angie, if you wanna go ahead and give your close out, that'd be great. Oh yes, well, I just don't wanna leave you with this. If you're growing your business and I hope that's what you're trying to do, don't be afraid to be audited. And when you're audited, you know, there are times where the IRS pe check to people. So you're not necessarily wrong, but don't be afraid to take your rightful deductions. Uh, again, so I'm Angie Tony, a licensed CPA in the state of New York. I'm located in Virginia, but I do serve clients all over, also small businesses. And uh, you can reach me at angelfinancial.services. All the phone numbers are there, uh, emails, so forth, so forth. So I won't bore you with all that. <laughs> Thank you. And I am Shantoya Jones of Agna Financial Services. The best way to reach my firm is either through my website, www.actnowfs.com or via phone at 904-413-1159. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we've covered the Northeast here. I think I'm New York, Virginia, and Florida, right? <laughs> okay, great, great. All right, everyone. So have a great weekend. Everyone stay safe and definitely uh, join us next week when we're back and Ladies, thank you again for sharing and take care. Thanks for inviting us. You're welcome. Bye-bye.